start. Uh, this is the uh, May 7th meeting of the Charter Review Committee, which is being recorded. Uh, there are six members present. We do have a quorum. Annie Lesko, who normally takes our minutes, is not here tonight. Uh, she will transcribe the minutes from the recording. And, and Molly has told me that she's running late. She expects to join us. Um, you want me to do a roll call? Yes, yes. If we, if we have any roll call votes, we can call the roll. Um, all right, first order of business is to approve the minutes of our last race <coughs> on April 16th. Uh, are they a motion to approve? You weren't here. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any revisions in the minutes? Okay. Those in favor of approving? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? None. Okay, that's proofs. Five zero and one abstention. I have uh, one piece of mail. A uh, card from uh, Naomi Leslie, Gleason Road. Uh, I'm a Ward 1 resident ready to ask you to support ranked choice voting in Northampton. I think this is a promising movement that our city should support for a more democratic voting process. Put that in the record. All right, public comment tonight. I know uh, Bill Newman is here wishing to, to address us. Um, Kathy, did you want to address us? Okay. Bill, at the podium, please. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Bill Newman. I live on Marmon Road, and my office is in downtown Northampton. I I'd like to bring to your attention something that I think is of great significance to the city, and certainly has been and will remain in the national news, and that has to do with what is Section 1.3 in the Charter, Division of Powers, what in the federal system we call Separation of Powers. And the Northampton provision is less than stellar in its clarity. Um, it says the administration of the fiscal, prudential, and municipal affairs of the city of Northampton, comma, with the government of Northampton, comma, shall be vested in, in an executive branch headed by a mayor and a legislative branch consisting of a city council. Le leaving aside the wordsmithing of it for a moment, the, Clarity, such as it is, comes in the next sentence, which says the legislative branch shall never exercise any executive power, and the executive branch shall never exercise any legislative power, which doesn't answer the question, what is legislative power, and what is executive power. So, I, I have heard it said by any number of people, say, well, the city council of Northampton really only has one authority. It can reduce the budget proposals of the mayor, and it has, as a practical matter, no other authority at all. And I think a lot of people in North Ham, when you explain your city council is really just a figurehead kind of debating society, say, that's wrong, that's completely wrong. I know the city council can do more than that. But it's not at all clear, and while I think the city council can and should be able to under this charter, it's not at all clear under the charter, what legislative authority the city council actually has. And this question, of course, came up uh, when we had the debate over a welcoming city ordinance that was then resolved through a mayoral uh, uh, directive and a directive from the chief of police. But it was the opinion of the city solicitor, my esteemed colleague, Mr. Sewell, that the city council did not have the authority to pass what, by the way, passed unanimously with the uh, uh, approval of the law department in the city of Springfield, which has, by the way, a strong mayor form of government. Now, I think that the legislature in this city should have the authority to pass ordinances um, as a general matter. 
and pass policy for the city. And to say, no, your legislature has no authority to even propose or enact policy for the city strikes me as dead wrong. And I think would strike most persons in the city as being untrue. But in fact, when you look at our city charter, it's not clear what authority, what power the city council has. This comes up every 10 years. And I think on this 10 year review, it's trying to say our city council is a real legislature with real authority and it should be allowed to pass real laws, subject of course to the veto authority, which is very, very strong, of the mayor. That seems to me how the government is conceived of, and it's how most of the persons in Northampton think it should work and does work. But according to our charter, the answer to what I'm saying is, no, Newman, you're completely wrong. The city council in Northampton has no authority. It can only reduce the proposals, the monetary proposals, the spending proposals of the mayor. And that strikes me as wrong, and it is really subject to a fix, because the city charter functions as the constitution of the city. And so, if you were to add, if the city charter were to add something along these lines, I'm not trying to wordsmith this, but I am trying to give the notion, that the legislative power of the city's council shall, without limitation, include the right to prescribe by ordinances, by ordinance, policies of the city. And policies of the city shall include, or not limited to, the right to prescribe the goals, functions, and responsibilities of city offices and departments. If there is a debate about what the, the legislature, what the council is doing, let there be a debate. If the mayor is going to veto it, let him veto it, or she veto it. But to say that the legislature in the city of Northampton should be essentially neutered and have no authority seems to be wrong. And we don't need to look any further than our national government to know that the legislative authority matters, or it should matter. And I think it should matter locally as well. And so to say, again, that the city's council is reduced to this little bit of authority that it might be able to exercise sometime and all the rest of it is just words is wrong. And I would hope that this committee would seriously consider making clear that the city council should have robust legislative authority. You can do that because the charter of the city is the constitution and the foundational law of the city. And I hope that will receive your serious consideration. And I'd be happy to answer any questions if I'm entitled to do that. But you can my esteemed colleague, Mr. Seward, might think that is out of order, or he may think it's out of order, but I'd be happy to if there are any questions either now or later. Uh, just to be clear, Bill, you are suggesting that language be uh, uh, put into the charter that, that in effect, um, defines what already happens by practice in terms of the city council having the power to pass ordinances. I'm suggesting that the, you include language in the charter that makes clear the legislative power of the city council to, have, to pass these ordinances, which are that authority being, to the extent that it's happened, exceptions to the rule, as I understand what the city, count, what the, what the city solicitor has uh, advised with regards to the meaning of the charter. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but by and large, the city council should be allowed to pass ordinances that are, in, in its judgment, to the benefit of the city, subject, of course, to the veto power of the mayor. And then that process of overriding a veto if need be. But the uh, authority of the city council to pass laws for the city is not at all clear in the charter. And I'm saying that this body, I think, should take this opportunity to say, yes, a robust, vital legislature is crucial to democracy in the city, and the city council should have that authority. And, like, and the only way to do that now is to include language in the charter to preserve that right of the council, because without it, the council doesn't have it. And we will hear, I'm sure, time and time again, the next decade, no, city council, all you can do, the only authority you have 
is to reduce a proposal for expenditure by the mayor. And I think that's bad for the city. Did I answer the question? Yes. Bob? Um, certainly there have been matters brought to us in the short time that we've been around that have focused on the, the distinct distinction or the lack of distinction between legislative and executive powers, authorities, and duties. I mean, that's been a, that's been a theme that's come to us uh, in several different ways. Uh, and I certainly paid close attention to everything that you were saying, and you sounded fine to me up until the point where you said legislative ability to pass ordinances and policies, including those that determine how departments operate. That, that to me is, you know, that to me is a major red flag. So I'd be, I'd be happy to look at whatever it is you might want to propose, but I think that we have to be very judicious in how we define what legislative authority is. Certainly, we may need clarification in that respect, but I think we have to be very careful when we, when we do so that we also define what executive authority is as well. Let me give two responses, if I might. First, in terms of uh, prescribing day-to-day -day functions. There's nothing in this language that intends to do that or what I intend to do. That's clearly an executive branch function. And with the words that I had used was to prescribe the goals, the functions, and the responsibilities, but not the day-to-day -day operations of any, any, oper any, any department. Or, and the reason for using the words offices, offices and departments is because that's, those are the words that are defined in the charter. So uh, I think that that clarification is helpful on the whole, but it certainly, and, and I had when I originally uh, drafted this, had a specific exclusion for day-to-day -day functions of the department so as to not intrude on what you raised as I think a totally legitimate issue. But thanks for bringing it up. I mean, it is obviously a, an issue in various places. Uh, Bill, you say you've drafted something. You own a document you want to enter in the record here? I, I, I don't, but I'd be happy to send it to you if that yes. would be helpful. I'll be happy send it to the mayor's office. I will do that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, well, is there anything you'd like to say about the, the, the charters addressing legislative authority? Um, well, this, this issue has come up in several situations. And, um, it's my view, and it's also the view of the Supreme Judicial Court, that the primary function of a city council in a strong mayor form of government is around the budget, around money. And to say that the, uh, the, the body in the city controls passing of the budget is a figurehead is really a reach. The city council is also um, given very specific authority in other areas. The city council uh, uh, decides what property we're going to buy and what property we're going to sell, all kinds of property issues. Designates what use a property is going to be put to. Designates which department is going to be in custody and control of property. There uh, is, it, is responsible for the annual city audit. There are any number of things. There are all kinds of um, confirmation of of you uh, and every member of a multi-member body. So to say that the city councilors are figureheads is simply incorrect. Um, this issue was decided by the Supreme Judicial Court and this is how the SJC has come down. That, that, um, uh, that as I said, the major function of, uh, of the city council is around the budget and then there are other things that are in the city council's orbit. Um, the city council doesn't have their finger on the day-to-day -day pulse of how departments operate, what the financial situation is in different departments, and so the city council is really not in a uh, in a position to define the functioning of these departments, to define the responsibilities of these departments. Those are the words that that my esteemed brother at the bar used. F 
functioning and responsibilities. Those are executive functions. That's what I have to say. Okay, thank you. There's no one else up here who wants to address us um, as part of the public comment, right? Okay. Um, are there any updates from uh, committee members? Any, uh, anything? Yes, Bob. I'm going to send this later, but um, with regard to, to the, the public forum, and, and in particular with the ranked choice voting presentation, and all, um, inquiring minds seem to want to know, in that several people have asked me, um, what what implication passage of ranked choice voting? No, not no. Pardon me. <laughs> the the um, the sixteen year old voting. First off, the sixteen year old voting issue. Does that have any implication on the ability or inability of sixteen year old to run for office? Is there any connection in those two? Let's things? discuss that under the uh, right. the item on the agenda about the issues raised during last week's forum. Any, um, any other things outside of the forum issues? Ellen, did the did our special uh, status get approved by the city council? Last I believe week? it did. Okay. I understand. Okay, Sam, what, what happened? They approved it. I mean, it was, I mean, they did it in tribute. But, um, yeah. I had, okay. I had asked Ryan to do two meetings on this, and uh, all right. So we now have a special status, special municipal employee status. status. Okay. I feel so special. <laughs> <laughs> You've always been special to me. <laughs> okay. All right. Next item on the agenda is the uh, uh, the proposed change in the way that uh, vacancies are filled. Uh, for the trustees under the will of the Charles E. Forbes, Forbes Library. Uh, as, uh, as you recall, this was tabled uh, at our uh, April 2nd meeting. So we need a first motion to take it off the table. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstention? Dylan? Yes. Dylan abstains. And you want to recuse yourself from this discussion, correct? Right? Oh, All right. Thank you. All right, Dylan is recusing himself from this discussion because he is an employee of the board of right? uh, So, uh, just to bring everyone up to date, um, uh, in the last month, the mayor. Uh, communicated with the trustees at, at Forbes, and uh, the mayor had actually come up with language that was almost exactly what we had crafted uh, at that meeting, uh, taking into account the proposal by the trustees to fill vacancies internally, and then drawing from uh, other sections of the charter that, that put some constraints on on the timing of filling the vacancy uh, and who is eligible to be appointed to the to the uh, to the library board of trustees by the remaining trustees and the also the, uh, the timing uh, this will not be done if there's a regular city election to be held within 120 days if an election is held after that then the person elected at the regular city election will take office immediately. So all of that has been taken into account in what you see uh, on the agenda here tonight. Uh, so I think uh, to go forward with this, we need a motion to approve the language uh, that's uh, included in the agenda. Move to approve the new language. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All right, and uh, as you also recall, um, Lisa Danny and Russ Carrier are here tonight to address uh, questions that some of us had at that at that last meeting. So, um, go ahead with questions. I'm 
fine with the new language. I was just curious as to why Forbes trustees were different than the other elected. We're special too. Yes, <laughs> we're all very special. Um, but I mean, well, yeah. yes. Yeah, so so everybody's you know, we're we're quite pleased with this language as well, and and I will defer to Russ to, to give more details, but the it was an, an agreement, as uh, so I think you alluded to this agreement when we were here last time, um, that was reached in 2017 that really clarified a lot of the ambiguity in the relationship between the library and the city, and how, um, you know, there's not a, no two creatures are the same, I mean, if you look at us and, and Smith Vocational, or even Smith Charities, which appears on uh, the, the ballot, um, it's just hard to draw comparisons. So I think without specific questions, I would, it would be hard for me to sort of summarize how, the, how those are different. I guess the, the primary, the bottom line is it really all comes back to the will that, that started um, our organization and that we're governed by. And with that, maybe I'll turn it over to you, Russ, to see if you have anything to add to that specific question. Yeah, we had a meeting with the mayor that we, as part of our annual meeting, to talk about the budget. And when we got through talking about the budget, we had a very frank discussion about our differences uh, about this question. And um, you know, we were most concerned that we kind of felt like we knew if there was a vacancy, what kind of skills, what kind of talents that were most needed, and that we would be in a kind of unique position to be able to, to choose uh, the right person to temporarily fill the uh, vacancy. And we also, you know, argued that, that we felt like we would be outvoted potentially because we've had a number of incidents where there was one trustee that was missing and one time when we had two. So there's only five of us in total. So if this was, you know, the, the former procedure was in place and we had two vacancies, there would have been three of us and nine city councilors. So we would have been potentially outvoted three to one, if we had if there was disagreement about this, so we really felt that that was kind of uh, unfair. So when he communicated uh, this language, we had told him at the meeting that you know we felt pretty strongly that we wanted to have uh, the final say, but we were open to the process of how that would happen. And the wording sounded really good uh, to us. We checked with our uh, lawyers. Uh, the trustees and administration talked about it and were 100% in agreement with the wording that was uh, proposed. So we hope you'll support that. I had thought of the difference in numbers that the trustees have versus the, you know, because school committee and city council have the same. Yes, yeah, so yeah. That's a thank you. That's good to know. I think one of, one of the questions that was raised uh, is the uh, who is eligible to to run for election for trustee? Mm -hmm. And it's a city city resident. Well, it doesn't really yeah. <laughs> doesn't really even say that. It doesn't. No. In so the, in the will or the agreement. What is your understanding then of eligibility to be a Ford's trustee? Well, his, historically, people have been uh, registered voters in Northampton. Question, you know, the question is, is that. Um, you know, is that the only person that can do it? You, when you go back and look at, at the will, which of course is antiquated language and some other considerations that were actually modified at one point when the trustees mm. went before the probate court uh, yeah. in the 80s, um, some of the parameters were changed, but it doesn't seem like there's any specific, the language is pretty broad about who could run. It's, it's interesting because we've had um, presidents of the Friends and members of the board of directors of the Friends of the Library who haven't lived in Northampton and, and those are some of the finest people we've had working for the, for the library. But, you know, of course, that's a different body than the actual trustees, but you, know, you, you could do a wonderful job for the city and not be a resident of the city, I suppose. But. No one's, well, I, don't think, ever, I don't think anybody's ever challenged or even. Has there ever been an elected trustee who was not a resident? No. 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 Under the charter, uh, five members shall be elected by and from the voters of the city at large, is what the charter says. That's, that's, right. that's what the charter says. Yeah. So is there a potential conflict between the wording in the charter and the, the will? Well, I guess what we were saying when we first brought this up is, remember, we didn't think we, that uh, the library should have been included in the, in the charter. 
and the mayor said to us when we were in our meeting that it was too bad this whole thing wasn't uh, a part of the discussion when we had the overall agreement and got it all clarified back at that time, but of course it wasn't. So that, that's kind of what, where we were going from. I think that um, all, all elected officers in, are in the charter, and as much as as much as Forbes is slightly different than other departments of the city, they still are city elected officials, and they're in the charter, and they would have to be in the charter. Well, <clears throat> there's already been litigation over these, this this question about the. Forbes relationship with the city. Right, right. Um, we, I, I, as speaking for myself, I would I would like to avoid further litigation. Mm -hmm. um, do you, I mean, what? How do you square the, the charter and the, the sort of the imprecise language of the of the will? Well, I guess as far as we're concerned at this point, that those are not the, the issue. That the issue that you brought up is not one that we feel. Is, is worth being concerned about at this point. Okay. Okay. Any, uh, any further questions about the proposal that's before us? Uh, yes. Can, can I ask a question about the? Um, so it says no vacancy shall be filled under this section if a regular city election is to be held within 120 days. Actually, back up just a little. The candidate elected to an office filled by the appointment prior to the election shall be sworn in to complete the then unexpired term in addition to the term for which elected. So these are four-year terms. And if they're, if, if they're elected... to fill the unexpired term of somebody who left after, say, 12 months, would you then be in a situation where you'd have four people running for a position? They're, they're staggered, so I, one, I know one, that one election there's two on the ballot, and the next election there's three. Right, but I'm I'm not sure if this wording gets us. A little What's happened in confused. the past when we had that situation um, was there were two separate elections for library trustees. So the people who were in the regular rotation were up and had opponents, and the two vacancies were premature but on the ballot, and there was separate you know a separate race for those positions. So okay, you were right. There were I think there were either four or five people on positions of that in that one election. But the people who were on the ballot who um, weren't the regularly scheduled ones, it was just to finish up the, the, you know, the, the term. It was the term that was out of rotation. I should say. The intent of that sentence, Pam, is to have the <clears throat> person elected by the voters take office immediately. And not yeah. wait until January. Right. So the unexpired term is from November to January that they're taking over. I understand that part, but that's not what's confusing me. The part that's confusing me, it says, in addition to the term for which elected, right, if, so, it's not, if it's not so, their term to be elected in that cycle. Oh, I see. So you're going to... Then you could have four people on the ballot next time. Right, and they're all serving their, their full term, and you're going to have four people on the ballot going and then forward. And one person running at it be up the, in the two year. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. It's just. It's, well, when we had the vacancies in the past, as I said, we had two separate elections within that next regularly scheduled. And so the three trustees that were up for re-election naturally were on the ballot, and you could vote for them, you know, up to three. And then the people whose terms um, were needing to be filled, there was a separate place on the ballot to vote for them. And 
for one year, yeah, right? Right, and just until they finished, uh, until the next. Well, why would the, the um, appointed replacement fill out the term until that seat came up again for election? Whether it's a year, two years, right. however long it is, right. that appointed person serves until that seat would come up to for election yeah, again. The then election. that election would happen, and the person would cease serving, right. and the new person would serve for the, the couple of months, and then for the term. Right. We need to clarify this language, though, right? Because it's it's saying it, any regular city election versus one that term right. would that, be on the ballot. Right. So it's possible. How long are these terms? Four. Four, Four years. Mm -hmm. So it's possible somebody could serve three years yeah. as an as an appointed replacement. The problem, uh, I think, Pam, I see is that uh, the sentence before the one that Pam read is that persons elected by the trustees to fill vacancy shall serve only until Until the, the next regular right. city election, mm -hmm. when the office so. shall be filled mm -hmm. by the voters. Yeah. So that would, put, that, would, that would put that partial term on that that, yeah. that ballot. That's right. the problem. That's yeah. the problem. Well, that was done so that, you know, that an elected person would be filling the position for the most, as most you know, most of the term, rather than having an appointed person. Mm -hmm. So either at the next election, to, uh, the person elected at the next election shall only fill out the term of that seat and then it'll get back onto the rotation. That's what we need to do. It wouldn't be a four year term. Right. And that's what I think Russ was talking Right, and that's what's forward. happened in the past. Okay. Right. So we need to clean that so. Yeah. Except that there was no, you know, in the past there was nobody that was filling the position. Mm -hmm. It was a vacancy. Mm -hmm. I think it's so we're, we're, you know, if you think that there's some issues with the wording, I, you know, I think we're all in we're all in the same place about what the intent is. Mm -hmm. So if you want to tweak the language somehow, or if you feel it, it needs tweaking, that's fine. Just kind of let yeah. us know what you've come up with. I'm sure we won't have any issues with it if we're. So can I just clarify? Are we coming down on the side of, of finishing the term of that person they're replacing, or? We're not. No, having, it's not to finish the term. Elected, and then so that. But it wouldn't be a, f a four-year term. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just filling it until the next uh, city election, which is every two. Which years. is preferable to someone serving for three years. Mm -hmm. that doesn't apply. Yeah. Though it could be that the the unexpired term would normally be on that next mm -hmm. ballot. Could be. Mm -hmm. Could be. Yeah. Yes. In which case. In which case, that that person elected uh, would uh, would already would have a full four-year term in addition to the the whatever months. is left of the the months, the few months of the unexpired mm -hmm. term. So, uh, then. We, we need to be clear here for that um, in, in there, there are two possible uh, cases here. One is that the, the, expired, the unexpired term is, is put on the ballot uh, unnaturally and that person elected would fill the balance of the unexpired term. Or if the unexpired term is naturally on the next city election ballot, you know that person then has a four-year term plus months. So I think we need to address both of those possibilities in the language, right, Alan? I think that if you're going to make a recommendation on this, that this committee's got to figure out which direction it wants to go. In. Mm -hmm. All right, I see three intents here. One is that. The library gets to a point. We wish that appointment to be elected as soon as possible, like at the next regularly scheduled city election. And whomever is going to run for that seat can't claim they're running for re-election. Those are the three things. And then, I don't think that language accommodates that. I'm sorry. I, I think the language does not accommodate that. What, uh, language seems to indicate that 
you, you know, if you were you were elected, if you, if someone resigned with three years left and you got appointed three months before the next election, you would get three years. Then, if you ran for election, then if you got elected that year, you would get you get a total of seven years. Right. No, because we're, we're going to elect somebody at the next regular city election who's then going to serve for the balance of the term of the seat. And then they, go back, she, she was and then they go back, the seat goes back into the into natural the rotation. rotation. And they can run again. And they can run, there's no limits. So. Right, but they're not running for re-election. Yeah. The, candidate, the candidate elected to an office filled by appointment prior to the election shall be sworn to the office immediately to complete the then unexpired term, which could be up to three years. Okay, that's that might be what the problem is to say that it, it you complete the, you know, the it which could until happen, next, which until which could election. happen. You know, if it was if the the amount of time to be served was small enough, they could be mm -hmm. filling it until the end. But if it was towards the beginning of the term, so that needs to be replaced. In addition the to the term for which elected, so it could be seven years. If they would be elected as, as not running for re-election. Well, that's a separate issue, but, but if you get appointed, there's three years left in that term, you run in the next regularly scheduled election and you win, you get three years then unexpired plus what you yeah, ran. It would not be about that three years because there would be a municipal election before that, is what we're saying. Right. It's going to happen. I think that's the intent. I'm not sure that's what this says. It doesn't. It needs to be changed to reflect that. I guess okay. the committee needs to find out, figure out exactly the direction what you all want to go in and then put some language to it. Well, you would want to appoint someone to fill until an election. Correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so the, I mean, I, I still yeah. say the three things I said is the intent. Yes. Trustees get to yeah. a point. Well, the third point you have about like a, having an advantage, that's, I think that's pretty clear. Yeah. Like someone, if this person's elected to the trustees to fill a vacancy under this section, shall not be entitled to have the words candidate for re-election. So that's taken care of. I don't think we have to change right. that. Right. It's the two sentences that need to be. Does anyone on the committee disagree with the concept of appointing only until the next regular city election? No. 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 We're all in agreement mm -hmm. on that. We are in agreement then with the trustees. Mm -hmm. uh, is there uh, is there a problem with uh, the uh, the sentence, the candidate to elected to an office filled by appointment prior to the election shall be sworn to the office immediately. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can we end the sentence there and take care of the confusion? But it is true that they're, I believe that they are being installed to complete the then unexpired term. It depends, Alan, on when, when that occurs, because if the election is relatively mm -hmm. soon, then the election would determine the the, what, the, who is going to have the final two years of that four-year That's right. Term. Filling up. But, so but the but soonest if, election overrides the length of the, the term. term. Exactly. So, so that's it's a... Yeah. No, no the, next, no, the next election would be for the period of time that that seat is before the election, before it would naturally be on so the ballot. So it wouldn't start another four years. It wouldn't no. start another four years unless that term actually expired. I see what you mean. Yeah. Right. So yeah. really, yeah. so that's an important, if you just changed the term length, so if someone stepped down, they then the board elects someone, mm -hmm. you then put an asterisk and say your term now expires November 9th of whatever, 2021. You know, if you're replacing, that's when your term. Because that's when the municipal election is being held. Yeah. And then they would have control. Yeah. And then it's just more of a tracking thing. Yeah, that's what's always happened, that part. Okay. 
You know, the part that's never really been there is, is when there's a vacancy, you know, there's no one in that position until the next election. So that's the only thing that we're trying to change. But, but Russ, I don't think it's, it, if I heard you correctly uh, just now, I don't think it's until the end of the term for the person who you are replacing. It is until the next election. It is until the next municipal election. The, the, the thing that the trustees are doing it's is the, until the next regular yes. election. Yes. So and then the, the, the next regular election fills out the, the natural term of that seat, mm -hmm. and then there's another election for a four-year term. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the, that's the concept the here. Point, yeah. Yeah. Or not a sticking point, but that's the yeah. clarification. Well, that's yeah. what Seems we need. Like it was missing from the charter before with the, what the actual process was. Well, no, because it was a like man to the city clerk. Right. So a lot of this language has been taken from the city clerk uh, right. uh, section just just ahead of it, Sam. So that filling. Okay. If you look at section E, filling the vacancy, a lot of this language has been taken from that that section. Yeah, but the the trustees are different than the city clerk in that they're. Like their terms and it's a standard right. election. That's what you know that's what I mean. Well, that is the yes. that is, so that is I, that's the what I'm saying. Like I feel like that wasn't addressed in the charter before, which is a it, it was missing. All right, but so somebody gets appointed. There's like a year and a half left in the in the four year four year term. All right. So, gets appointed in June, which is three months before the election. The election is in November. So, so if I'm hearing correctly, people who are going to run for that seat are running for a one-year right, one partial year? term. Mm -hmm. Partial term. Well, I don't know what the term is. Well, I don't know. That's what, what I'm saying. I don't know how many years out the, the natural election for that seat would. Well, have been I said that there was a year and a half. Okay, left. so there's two and a half years. No, a year and a half. So. In June, it's it's happens in June, gets appointed in June, right? Which is 120 days before the election, so they can appoint. They appoint, come to November for that election. People who are running for that for two year term, one year only one left. But there wouldn't be one year left. Yeah, and there's every other. Couldn't be one year, Bob. Yeah, yeah. Had to be two. Would have to be two. All right, so. And it could, you know, it could be a one-year term. It's a different facts. It could be a, a one-year term. And as Russ said, they've had partial. elections partial, for a partial term of one year before. Yeah. Right. Yeah, people know what they're, so you what have they're to, getting So you have to make, somebody would have to make that clear to the candidates. Yeah. And we, we hope the charter might do that. Yeah. The charter should do that. We, yes. yeah. we need sure. to add language to clarify to clear. that uniqueness of the staggered for your turn. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, since the mayor um, has, has communicated with the trustees about this, I mean, you feel this is something we should uh, again delay and, and, and let the mayor um, uh, know what the, what the issue is that we brought up tonight about the, you know, the, the, the potential the, the impact of, of staggered terms. Um, I think Alan's had probably more substantive discussions than I have, but it oh sounds yes, like I the intent of this is the same. It's just how well, we get there. I, I think our intent, I think we're all on the same page in terms of the intent. The question is the clarity of the language. I'm going to take a wild shot and say that the mayor is nearly not going to be concerned about this kind of granular detail. He's fine with the concept of choosing their own replacements until the next election and you know he'll be fine if we craft language that makes it clear that the person elected at that next election fills out the natural term of that seat and gets back into the rotation that it was in before. I, I think he'll be fine with that so I don't think you need to postpone okay. to that. Okay, good. And what is, do you have specific language that you, you <laughs> Let me check my handy language. <laughs> no, I, I'd be happy to, to sit in a more deliberative way and, and go through this, and, and but I, not, on, not on the spot. I have to really think about it. Mm -hmm.
Hello, Molly. Hello. Come here. Yeah. I feel like our next step should be to think about language, but maybe not necessarily right. I'd be happy to come back with language yeah. at the next meeting. Oh, yeah. yeah. We don't need to rush. Okay. Yeah. But we're all on the same page right. of and the intent. No, no yeah. Right. And we right. clearly share it with you just to make sure. Mm -hmm. There's no hurry because there are no current vacancies. <laughs> on them. Okay. So. <laughs> so, um, to be clear then, um, we are in agreement with this is the intent of the language, and we're going to craft um, specific um, language that, that we hope for that situation. And uh, I think, I hope um, we can uh, get this to a final vote next next meeting. Yep. Okay. okay. Sure. Okay. Thank one you. last thing you're lucky to have, and he's one of our best. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I'll rejoin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, then uh, uh, I feel that we should uh, we need a motion to again table this uh, for two weeks. And the commission to table this until we have clarifying language. Okay, and uh, uh, Alan, you'll come back in two weeks at, at May, uh, May 21st. I'll, I'll send you some language okay. in, in advance. I'll send both of you some language. We'll just share that as well with our trustees. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we will. Okay. Lynn, that's good yeah. with you? Okay. All right. So uh, we have a motion again to table this. Mm -hmm. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Dylan? Okay. All right. No, Dylan didn't participate. He didn't abstain. He just did not participate. So. I was not at the table. Well, no, no, that's not an abstention because. That is, did not participate. And it's very right. important that he did not participate in okay. the record should be required. The record will reflect that uh, Dylan did not participate in any manner. Okay, uh, we are now on to discussing of issues raised at last Tuesday's forum. Um, I identified uh, four issues that I feel. Uh, we should talk about tonight. There may be others that other committee members heard, and, and please uh, say so. But um, I, I, what I'm looking for here is is uh, questions that you have that you want further answers to. Uh, what information you feel we should have before you before we vote as a committee on on uh, any or all of these, and including them in the chart, because they are all it would all introduce new concepts into the charter. So, what is it that you feel uh, we heard from proponents of all of these last Tuesday? But what other information um, do you feel we need to consider? In terms of what Bob had brought up earlier, it was sixteen-year-olds being eligible to run for office, I would think that the language we have in here now would say yes, they are, because the only qualification is to be a registered voter, correct? Yeah, that's, that's the way it's presented to me. That was a question that you had heard, Bob? Yes. That would that seem to make sense. Alan, do you concur with that? Um, I'm just looking, for instance, at the legislative branch. Any voter shall be able to hold the office of counselor at large. Um, so it is from the voters from each ward. So if you're a registered voter, I suppose you could run for office. That doesn't mean that we couldn't exclude running from office and we could change where it identifies voters as registered voters, 18 year old, 18 years of age and older. Mm -hmm. Might be interesting to, and I'm sorry I didn't do this, it just occurred to me. Might be interesting to check the legislation that's up there now for the state on the statewide side as to whether it deals with this. 
legislation for what ranked choice voting statewide, which the which the House and Senate are supposed to be considering now. That the budget's been oh, okay, but but let's stay on this sixteen-year-old um, question for a minute. Um, you're you're suggesting, Alan, that we could separate the two; that sixteen-year-olds could be eligible to vote, but not to run for office. Could do that. I mean, you're you're breaking new ground here. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. That's why I'm I'm asking what the sort of the the uh, concerns are of, uh, among committee members um, about any of these issues. Yes. Am I correct in assuming that we would be adding the new section if we decide to recommend any of these things? I, I wasn't clear where in the charter it addresses this stuff, so I, my assumption is that we would have to add a new section. Mm -hmm. Like a new definition, like mm -hmm. there are voters, and then there, for the purposes of municipal elections, there are those who are 16 to 18. Yeah, and like even ranked choice voting and mm -hmm. absentee voting, like that's not currently addressed in. Yeah, yeah, I haven't really gone through the charter and looked at how we would incorporate those types of things, but I'm sure there would be some, some cutting and some adding. Mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, I so where's the thing? A lot of wordsmithing, but it's also mm -hmm. figuring out what would be what's in there now that's inconsistent mm -hmm. with ranked choice voting. I mean, obviously, we're gonna if we went to full ranked choice voting, we would obviously get rid of the, the whole section about preliminary elections. That would be out. Mm -hmm. um, and so. So if a sixteen-year-old is eligible to vote, but they're not eligible to vote for the next election, mm -hmm. they can vote for mayor and become elected. Would there be any thing like signing contracts or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are some That's things like point. that that would be problematic. So I would, you know, probably be a good idea to define another class of voters for municipal only voters, which are 16 and 17 year old domicile, domiciliaries of Northampton. Um, and um, when you talk about voter, you're talking about 18 and over. And when you're talking about municipal only voter, it's 16 and 17. And you could have a prohibition against you know, uh, municipal only voters running for office. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so just to be clear, um, even if we chose to go in this direction and allow 16, amend the charter to allow 16, 17 year old votes, we would still be eligible. I mean, we'd just be adding to you know, other communities that are sending a, a home rule petition to the state legislature, correct? Like, we don't have the power to do this no. on our own. We don't have the power to do any of right. this. So it would just be another voice along with, because Wendell, Lowell, Shelburne, Cambridge, Beverly, Somerville, Ashfield have all either sent home rule petitions or are in the process of sending home rule petitions mm -hmm. to the state legislature. For 10 years, they seem to have been going there mm -hmm. and then just, it's they don't even refer to how they, they just say they die. A couple of them have gotten a few steps into the debate, and then, you know. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, in it looks like in 2010, after Lowell City Council voted to lower the voting age to 17 for municipal elections, a bill was presented by Kevin Murphy of Lowell, which cleared several hurdles and finally stalled before a third hearing. The most recent attempt was the Empower Act, um, which is a current bill in the state legislature that would make it easier for cities and towns to lower the voting age on the local level. Um, that was filed by Andy Vargas of Haverhill and Dylan Fernandez of Falmouth in the House and Henry Chandler in the Senate. And it would give the communities the power to lower the voting age on their own, but only for local elections. So it was in January of this year, it was referred to the Committee on Election Laws and the Senate and the House concurred, and that's where it stands. Mm -hmm. So even if we were to do this, ambitious it's thing. Still We're still eligible to just right. sit in the state yeah. house with no explanation. 
as with any of our changes right. that would require. Right. That would require mm -hmm. a petition. Yeah. So that's all I learned, really, is that these things get to a certain level, as much will as there is. I mean, and maybe collective will is what we're looking for, is mm -hmm. a lot of communities' mm -hmm. movement towards things like, you know, ranked choice voting and things mm -hmm. gain mm -hmm. power when more communities do them. Mm -hmm. But ultimately... Dylan, the communities that you cited, uh, have they been standalone proposals to lower the voting age in, in those communities to 16, or have they been part of a, uh, an overall charter? Uh, I think that they were mostly standalone, and you know, they may have, some of the communities may have had state legislators that banded together to try to propose a bill, got a, certain, got a reading, got two readings, and then. Uh, Ellen, do you have any, uh, any knowledge of whether the legislature would look more favorably on a proposal like a lower uh, municipal voting age for part of a, an, an overall revision of the charter? No, I really don't know. Does it go as one package? Like, it's one home rule petition. It's a home rule petition. And uh, I guess mm. I shouldn't know this. Like, <laughs> are they allowed to take parts out of it? Like, well, when, when, um, when the city council votes to authorize a, um, uh, a, a petition of this sort, it designates the extent to which the, it authorizes the legislature to make changes. Okay. Right? Mm. So, um, so you, it could be sent down. Absolutely, we want it passed as it is or not at all. Mm -hmm. um, authorizing changes, grammar, punctuation, mm -hmm. structural, mm -hmm. not substantive. And then there's the substantive with the approval of the mayor, mm -hmm. as long as it is consistent with the underlying intent of the mm -hmm. of this language like that. Um, so those are generally the three choices. Okay. Um, the more leeway you give the legislature, the more likely you're going to have your act passed. Mm -hmm. But I really don't have a, a good yeah. feel for, I mean, other than what Dylan just said, mm -hmm. with the legis how the legislature would um, approach this as part of an overall package of changes to the charter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nationally there's been movement. There are some communities that have done, the, have done this recently, um, but of course the rules for every state are so vastly different mm -hmm. that it doesn't really necessarily have any relevance for what we're So we don't know if any of these were part of a charter review, or we're saying that they weren't? They were they were standalone? They, they were mostly standalone. standalone. Okay. I believe they were mostly standalone, but a couple of them could. Right. That would be a good thing. Yeah, why don't, you, why don't you check that and see if there was any difference in the way that they were handled, if it came as, as part of a whole charter review versus a standalone proposal. Okay. All right, so what I'm hearing then is the, 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 an issue that we need to take into account here is if we recommend a 16-year-old voting age in Northampton that we would have to address um, the impact on potential candidates as well who are 16 or 17. I'm sorry, I, I was... I mean, we, we, we would have to address, I mean, as, as part of a recommendation to lower the voting age in North Carolina to 16, mm -hmm. we would have to address the question of 16 and 17 year olds running for office. Yes, I think you would. Okay. Because you can't just define them as a voter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there are there other issues, other questions uh, that, that, that committee members want answered uh, before we deliberate further on 16-year-old voting? Can you, uh, Dylan, incorporate as part of your task then to to uh, look at what? section we perhaps consult with Alan on this, what section of the charter we would have to also deal with in terms of sure. voter, uh, yeah. uh, in terms of uh, 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 office seekers. Would that include um, appointments to committees and, and the appointment we're saying that we think <coughs> that uh, to, to exclude 16 to 18 year olds from running for our office, or does it also exclude them from committee appointments? Well, and then goodbye is, let me go look at the definition. Yeah,
I think you just have to be a resident. I don't think no, you have to be a voter. Because mm. we don't okay. check their voter status when we, mm -hmm. like whether they're registered or not, before we put people forward. Mm. And therefore, you're not checking the page. Um, no. Okay. Just have to be a resident? Yes. Oh. According to the Secretary of State, candidates must be at least 18 for state offices, 25 for U.S. House, or 30 for U.S. Senate. But it does the same thing about local elections. Mm -hmm. So was that a local jurisdiction thing, Alan? Or? Even if, even if it is a local jurisdiction, no, the, the definition of voter is is voter is defined by the state law, and um, and so we would need a special act to do this. There's no way we could do this locally. So it'd be helpful to know when it what's in the mix right now in some of those cities and towns, and also maybe to look take a look at the home rule. I mean the um, the empowerment act. Yeah, I like that because I'm kind of curious about that. S.389. What is it again? S.389. Okay, thanks. Um, what were the other communities in Western Massachusetts that proposed this as a home rule? Wendell, Ashfield, and Shelburne. Okay, three Some of those are very recent. I'm sorry, I don't remember right which. You might, you might uh, check in, uh, Dylan, if you would, and, and with, with one or two of them and see if they have uh, addressed the question of, of uh, office seekers uh, as part of their home rule petition. Um, I just have some, like, I guess, general questions, and maybe we don't know the answers yet, but if we do this and it goes through, and a 16-year-old registers to vote for municipal elections, do they have to re-register when they become 18? And if so, how would we get that word out? Because we could end up losing voters. Yeah, or creating issues at the polls if they show up to vote and they're not registered anymore. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I think they would only be able to register, I'm assuming, through municipal means, like mm -hmm. they couldn't go to the registry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so the registry does allow them to pre-register at age 16, and right now we have 178 pre-registered voters in Northampton. That's about 40% of the total 16-year-olds um, in the city. What percent? 40. 40. Wow. 40%, yep. So, so we have 645 16. students between the ages of 16 and 18. Um, it would definitely have to be a system that's run completely outside of the VRIS system. Um, and the state law requires that first time voters, when they vote, they have to show uh, ID. So they, so they would definitely have to do that for that election. But then when they turn 18, they would still be subject to that same thing because it shows up on their. Um, it shows up on the uh, voter um, log that they're a first-time voter in the system, in the state system. So they would be required to show their ID from 16 to 18. So, so they're 18. And uh, this municipality would determine what type of ID. Mm -hmm. or well, you, uh, if you define it in the charter, yes. If not, it's in the it's in the laws. The type of ID that they'll take. I'm sorry, can it's in the state law. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is currently a pre-registration system. Now, how could that be if if Northampton were to uh, lower the municipal voting age to 16? How could that be adapted in Northampton to? to have those uh, young people who have pre-registered and classified as Northampton voters for municipal elections? Well, the, the, unfortunately, there's no way to get the state system to just allow us to see that these 16-year-olds are, quote-unquote, registered. 
right? So, they, mm -hmm. so we'd have to keep the system completely separate. Um, so it'd have to be a paper trail, basically, mm -hmm. a paper system for the 16 to 18 months. Do you anticipate any substantial cost? Well, at, at 445 voters, I'd have to say no. Okay. I don't really um, anticipate that that would be, um, you know, I mean, you'd have to do some training of the election workers. Um, it's actually a number that I, that's a lot lower than I mm -hmm. thought it was going to be. You know, where I could see in the system, because they show up as residents, Mm -hmm. So. Okay, but so one of the things that needs to be considered then is the mechanism for for registering these um, young people in Northampton as municipal voters. But you're, you're not you're saying <coughs> that you can't you do not anticipate it will be a, a financial issue. I mean, I, I don't think so. Okay. I mean, you know, we we could use this, you know, still use the state forms. There's a little box that's sitting up on the uh, up on the file cabinet in the city clerk's office that says pre-registrants, and I hand counted them. That's how I got the 178. Um, so you know, it's a completely you know complete paper system essentially. Thank you, Kevin. My neck has been getting a workout. <laughs> um, well, I mean, these are these are all things that these are consequences of new ground that we need to we need to consider if we're going to in fact plow new ground. So, it's kind of, I appreciate hearing your your, your thoughts on this. Um, I don't know if this is appropriate or not, but I'm curious if the city or town clerks in the communities that Dylan mentioned, if they maybe talk to um, their legislators and either have weighed in on some of what we've discussed, so we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. Mm -hmm. They've already gone down that road with some of this. Mm -hmm. well, and to be clear, some of those communities are working to send home rule petitions. Yep. So they, they might not be that far along in the process. And also, if it's been referred to the Committee on Election Laws, I wonder if these sorts of is there a Senate bill? If they were to make this or? change, what what effect would that right. what effect right. would that have? If they allow a number of communities and that change. So these are smaller one that came from. What? I think we just have a dozen on the committee for elections. I think for some reason that's sticking. Well, and, I'm sure it's uh, so instantly check yeah. and tell us. <laughs> um, Yes, I, I, I agree, Lynn, that's a good idea. One of, what we see yeah. if, if legislators have been con consulted by mm -hmm. many of these uh, communities. Um, all right, anything else on this 16-year-old vote? Uh, let's, let's go back to the... Uh, uh, to the no excuse absentee voting, um, there is a there is a uh, at least one bill um, uh, that Pammy mentioned last last week, House Bill 78, uh, that has been uh, referred also to the Election Laws Committee. Um, that's that's being considered as, uh, on the state level. Um, uh, Pam at the forum suggested that that Northampton shouldn't wait for the state to act and that we, we um, could act as a city to uh, enact uh, a more flexible form of absentee voting. I think that's, that captures what, what you suggested. Are there, are there questions uh, about this concept that committee members want to explore? Yes. Punch. Um. I, before I, I was just trying to understand better how this would actually work. So a ballot 
you could come in and request the ballot for any reason, or however the mechanism is, you could just request the ballot, similar to absentee voting. You don't have to give a reason this in this case. And we can early vote. So absent. Right. So it under will, state law, there's only three reasons why you can request an absentee ballot. Right. But so no excuse voting would be similar, except you don't need a reason. Right. Those three reasons would be stripped away, and you could mail it to the person's house. They could vote and have to mail it back to you. Mm -hmm. And then I think if I, maybe I misheard this, but if that person chose to, they could walk it to the ballot box that day, or they could choose to not exercise that ballot and go to the polls and vote that day. Well, there is a mechanism in the that, that allows you to do that. You can't, the, the um, state law doesn't allow you to bring a cast ballot to the polls. Um, you have to bring it to the city clerk's office and then they have to deliver it to the polling location. So that wouldn't change. I don't anticipate that that would change. Um, but if somebody requested an absentee ballot and then they, their plans changed and they all of a sudden wanted to go to the polls, there's a mechanism for that too. That they have to just come, we have to confirm that they haven't cast a ballot at all, and then they bring a, you know, a, cert a certificate to the polling location, which states that, that they can be given a ballot even though it's marked on the, um, the, the polling books that they requested an absentee ballot. And um, would, I, would you anticipate needing to order double the number of ballots to achieve this, or? No, no. But well, by, mean, by, by and large, meaning like if, so if I order, or if I call and say, I, my kids are coming home from school, mm -hmm. and they're gonna come, they, they're gonna just mail them, they're gonna, cast their ballot from home here, and then I'll mail them back to you. Then the kids come home and end up, for whatever reason, being able to go to the polls election day and want to show up and vote. You're going to have to have enough ballots to accommodate that at the precincts, and also you've now mailed you know, X number of ballots to someone's house. But if you mail that a ballot, can they then go to the polls and vote? Yes. They can? Well, they, yeah, we, I, that's a situation where they'd have to come to the clerk's office and get a certificate from the clerk, you know, indicating that they haven't cast a ballot yet, that one hasn't been returned in, on their behalf. But, so, so by law, I'm required to have a ballot for every registered voter in the city. That's a regular ballot. The absentee ballots are different. They look totally different. Mm -hmm. Um, and usually for a municipal election, you know, I only order 100 ballots per precinct and I never run out. So I, I don't anticipate that that would, that would change. So there would always be a ballot at the polling location because I could never predict if someone was going to order you know, an absentee ballot or not. Lynn, is the is, is the underlying question here then the, the the unknown number of people who may take advantage of looser absentee voting, looser, uh, more flexible absentee voting, that it may uh, that it may encourage many more people to take advantage of, of, of that. And so Do you mean you're, you're take advantage in a good way or bad way? No, no, no. I'm, I'm saying to use absentee voting. You, you're, you seem to be questioning the, the potential for having, um, you know, having a need for more absentee ballots in addition to the regular ballots that, are, that always have to be at the polling place. Right. I was just confused because I think the first time we discussed this, the statement was made that you could walk the ballot in mm -hmm. to the precinct, mm -hmm. and then I was thinking. So are you ordering how like how how many are you ordering and is it the same and do you have to have double now because if I showed up at the polls even though you mailed me one I was just confused as to how that would actually work um, and 
and I, I'm still concerned that this is going to create a lot of confusion at the polls. I think that I'm fully supportive of the House Bill 78 to change. If I'm understanding that correctly, it would strip away some of those, uh, the three reasons why, and you could just request a ballot. Mm -hmm. I think that makes a lot of sense, um, but I'm, con I'm concerned about adding a third type of way to cast the vote, or fourth technically, if you count going to the polls meaning absentee, early voting, no excuse voting, and then showing up at a polling location. So, but, so, 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 I, so the, the whole concept behind getting rid of all the reasons is what came, what came to be known as early voting. So you could even request, I mean, we think of early voting, you come to the city clerk's office and you cast your ballot. But that's not the only way that you early vote. It was intended to take away all the excuses that people didn't vote mm -hmm. or all the reasons why we allowed people to cast a ballot and not go to the polls. So technically you could request an early ballot to be sent to your house. Do you know what I'm saying? So so but essentially only through those three reasons. Right no. Now. So no, early voting you could mail we could mail you a ballot for to with early no vote excuse voting. voting. Not the early voting is in person. Right no. now, the way it exists right now. Well, that's the way we think of it, but that's not technically what it is. You can request an early ballot and have it be sent to your house. The whole reason why early voting came to be was so that you didn't have to say I'm out of the city or I have a physical disability, or one of those three excuses. That was why early voting came to be. People wanted to vote, but they said, I, can't, I'm not, I don't fit any of these categories. So they came up with early voting. I mean, so it's combining everything. It's early absentee voting. Without reason. Yes. But we don't, do, we don't do that sort of early voting for municipal elections at all. And in fact, we only did them for the state election and not even for the preliminary last time, but that's changing too. So essentially, we would, we, what I'm looking to add is early voting instead of absentee voting for all municipal elections. Yes. I know it's confusing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to whip those ballots out all over. Lynn, do you have further? Not yet. No, I'm still trying to. Yeah, I probably will, but not yet. I know everybody, you know, because people are lined up outside the city clerk's office, that's early voting. But no, and in fact, we have process applications to send early ballots to people's house. Okay, so for this early voting, for all municipal elections, do you anticipate um, a, a cost uh, in terms of having to have additional, a large number of additional ballots? No. No, right? I don't. I don't know. You don't know. No, I'm saying no. I'm saying no. 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 You don't anticipate additional costs. Okay. Um, what? Uh, what? Uh, what would you, is there, are there additional steps that would have to be taken, additional, is there some additional mechanism that would have to be put in place to accomplish, accomplish what you're hoping to do? No. Okay. So up until this point, if someone requested an absentee ballot, and then didn't fill out the ballot, and then arrived at the polls, would they have been able to vote? Um, they'd have to, so they'd have to come to the city clerk's office to get that certificate, and then they'd be eligible to mm -hmm. vote. Okay. So um, no matter who gets a ballot, either by going, there's always a certificate that you need to have by the end of the day before voting day, I guess, so maybe voting day, I don't know. Mm -hmm. If you've been, if you taken a ballot or received a ballot or got ballots for your kids. Um, if you want to go and vote 
you have to know the day before voting day and to you have up until 12 noon the day before the election to so you cast have to go to city hall yep. to be to, to be certified as one who could vote yes even though you may have had a yes. vote at your house yep mm -hmm. no, you can do that on the day you can do that on the or election day. day yeah you can do yeah. Wait, but it's a certification so either way you're going to certify person to be able to vote so it's yeah. not like they're going to be a fellow here yeah, i love person. my i love my my ballot at college. Yeah, yeah. I'm here today. I want to vote. Yeah, you, sh you, we allow you to vote. Yeah, absolutely. So, is that a common occurrence? I mean, it's not common, but it ha it does happen. You know, two or three times okay. All right. an election, but yeah. How, how what percentage of our voters voted early this year um, in the the election in November? As, uh, is it, was it, it was a much greater amount of people than when we had just absentee voting, I guess. Yeah, we, played, we worked it that way, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, so uh, we had 2,500 people early vote. But we're talking about a state election, too. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't generally get that kind of turnout for a municipal election, which is what we're trying to improve mm -hmm. here. Um, you know, we have the ballots waiting for you. You gotta show up. You no, know, that's the thing. It's just, you know, we're trying to improve the voter turnout. And do you mind restating one more time? I'm sure I'm not the only one. At least, maybe there are folks on camera. What it is that we want to do differently here, just in a nutshell. So right now, if somebody came in today to vote, let's say it's election day, or you know, two weeks before election day, and they said, I would like to have an absentee ballot, we would say, are you gonna be out of the city? Are you unable to go to the poll on election day? Are you, I can't remember what that third one is, but in, in any event, those are the only three reasons why we would give you a ballot to vote other than on election day. Mm. So if you said yes, if you said no, that you don't qualify, then you'd have to go to the polls or not vote. Right. So the goal would be to get allow people to vote if they don't need. They're not the sure they're going to be here. Um, homebound. You know, they're, they're home. Yeah, they're, they're homebound home. or whatever. You this know. sounds like it makes it easier for people to vote. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Done. It makes it easier for people to vote, and I, I, I would think it also simplify the process in your office since you wouldn't be asking those questions. Right. Okay. I'm for it. Other, other issues? Just that, a couple quick questions, because yes. that helped a lot, that clarification. Um, so the part, could anyone request it for that person, or would the person have to request it themselves? So there are... Built into the law, there are certain, you know, um, not absentee, I mean, no excuse voting. Like, who could make that request? Because you're not just going to automatically. A family member, okay. somebody who lives in the same household as you. Yeah. But they, you know, they, they, under no circumstances are we allowed to give a ballot over the counter. So if somebody came in, they'd either have to vote on the spot, and so it would have to be that person, or the ballot would have to be mailed to the individual if it were requested on behalf of someone else. <clears throat> You're not allowed to give a ballot over the counter for some other person than the individual who walked into your office, is what you're saying? They, they can't take the ballot with them. Right. So even if they come to the office and they say, I want to absentee vote, they have to vote on the spot. And this request could be done online, or does that be in person? We we do um, take online requests. Yep. Yeah. Um, 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 there is a there is a um, an application process, but yeah, we could take a phone request to send you an application, and then you sign. You know, the voter has to sign that they want this to happen. So, and they have to do it for every election, right? Um, There's not a way to sign up once. There is. Yep. And then get it mailed every time. Yep. Okay. 
all elections this year, yep, is a mechanism that people get their ballot automatically. Just for that year. But it's not like you yeah. sign up once and like the next 10 years you get it. Right. Okay. So even people who have a physical disability that prevents them from going to the poll where they automatically get a ballot sent to them, they need to they need to have their signature on file to say this needs to continue for the following year. Okay. Yeah. Is that the case in other in states where they like you know we always talk about Oregon? Is that just is it automatically mailed without request? Is that the point they're at? Yeah. California does that as long as you're active voter. Okay. So are there any further questions for Pam on this issue? No. Okay. Who said no? I did. Oh, well, Molly did, yes, but... I'm sure I will have more once I am just, yeah, thinking thinking the whole thing through, but... Hmm. Okay, so is there anyone on the committee who would be willing to uh, draft some language that would be um, what we would actually be considering for inclusion, uh, including in our recommendations. Is there anyone who has any strong interest in this? I have. Like I said, I do it like I didn't have the ability, but I don't have <laughs> <laughs> to draft that kind of language. Can I just ask, do we know, has our city council done anything to, to express support for that house bill? I know Bill's not here, but I don't know if any. Do you know, Sam? I'm sorry, what uh, the House Bill that would essentially do this, right? House Bill 78, which is the one that you mentioned. I mean, they're, they're, that's the one that I found. There may be other bills that, are, that address this as well. Because I know we've done something for the 16 year old voting. Mm -hmm. but it just seems like we should if if there's something pending in the state that would make this larger than just us. Mm -hmm. But anyway, separate from this work, but the language could be similar if we wanted to certainly pull from it. You're not, Pam. You're not aware of. They haven't taken of any any um, support expressed by the city council for HB seventy eight. Okay. No, it hasn't been on any of their agendas. Okay. Okay. No. So, uh, Sam, can you take can you take this on? Can you um, can you do both of those things? Can you check to see uh, uh, what, what the language is in HB seventy eight? It's very short. It's beautifully okay. succinct. Well, that's good. Okay. Uh, and do you think it could be uh, adapted to what we need to recommend in the, in the charter? Okay, can you can you take that on? Thank you. Maybe on one of your four AM car rides into Boston. If you're not driving. Don't do it while you're driving. Okay. Um, now the other issue that um, that Pam raised last week was um, has been alluded to here is the uh, mailing of ballots to all registered voters without request. And that's done, I believe, I found it in three states, uh, California, Oregon, and Washington. Is that correct? Or Colorado, isn't it? I don't think. I think it's Colorado. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. So this would be something that would increase costs. Because you would still, like, this would, now you'd have double the ballots, correct? Because you would still have to have, or would you still have to have them in, in the actual polling places if you're mailing them to everyone? Well, it would def definitely depend on the, you know, the end result of this. I mean, if we decided to, I mean, I think my initial thought was to have the ballots mailed in addition to having election day, um, I don't know that that would be, I think that that would be too cost prohibitive. Yeah. You know, so I think we'd have to have one without the other. Okay. So people would get their ballot 
And I think that's that's what my presentation is sort of um, was trying to allude to that um, people would get their ballot and have an opportunity to vote on it at home, and then they'd return it to a central location, and that would be. You know, we'd have to define that as well. If it would be the city clerk's office, mm -hmm. or if you know, if he felt that that was just too um, <coughs> isolated, yes. that there would be a central, you know, location where the ballots would be collected and and cast, mm -hmm. essentially. So we did we did do some sort of cost analysis we call the state of Oregon, the elections division. They were still in the office when we were at our board of registrar's meeting. Um, and essentially there they were down to a dollar sixty five a ballot mm -hmm. for the total cost to produce the ballot and mail it out. Um, I don't know that we you know they have tremendous scales of economy. Mm -hmm. You know, with their process, it's a statewide system. Um, I don't know that we would get to that point, but um, there is some, some, you know, some gains that could be made um, by eliminating elections at, at the polling locations. I don't know if that would be. What, what do you calculate the cost for down in Right now, four or one, right? Well, there's a, it's, it, you know, it's just basically it varies depending on how many voters show up. Mm -hmm. So but it's a flat. The, uh, that 401 figure was from which which election? On average, it was from At 2009 to 2017. Okay. Right. So that was over a period of time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And here. Okay. Yeah, it varied greatly. I think it went up as high as eleven dollars a ballot when there's twelve point six percent. So if it was all mail ballots and there's no polling places, are you still using the machines we just got to cast? The well, well, we would. You would be right. So it's not like those are some loss. You still have to feed them in to the machine. Right. Yes. Yeah. And they'd still have to be programmed for each ward and precinct because we still okay. have ward, mm -hmm. you know, ward seats. Especially if we were to adopt range choice voting, then there's software for our ballot machines that would allow for those calculations that are done by hand would be very we haven't done a lot of homework about the ranked choice voting, but my understanding is is that our machines would still be used at the polling locations very similarly to how they're used today. And that it's the central point in the city clerk's office at the end of the evening that has that special software um, where everybody returns their information from the polling oh, location okay. and then it gets tabulated at the end so of the that's where the software update takes place. In the, the feeding of all the information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then that's when the where the end result comes out at the end of the evening. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you inquired, Oregon. You haven't um, you haven't looked at either Washington or, or Colorado. Yeah. Other questions uh, the committee members have about this kind of stuff. Blanket mailing of ballots to all registered voters. If we instead of your census, you'll get your ballot. Mm -hmm. So if we had that, then we wouldn't need the no excuse absentee voting. Right. What's the return rate when you, when you mail out a census? What what's the return rate? The meaning bad addresses. How many come back to you undelivered? It's a small percentage, really. Fifteen um, percent, so, maybe. So theoretically, I mean, you, you also have to understand too that we're sending to vacant addresses. 
even though we know that we're vacant. Yeah. We, but, we're required by law to send them there. Okay, so in, in the case of a, of a ballot, you'd be sending it to the address of the registered voters. Do you have a sense of how accurate that database is? Pretty accurate. It's the same database. Yeah. I'm just wondering, you know, how many people would claim that they didn't receive their ballot? And what that... I, I think, not to interrupt you, but I think this is where I think my biggest confusion was. Was one of the first nights you talked about it. I think I understood this to be one and two were the same thing. Mm. And that's, and I think my questions when we, a couple minutes ago, were yeah. to that, that how many people could show up at the polls and say, well, I don't, I didn't want to vote that way, and then what do we do? Or, to, not to interrupt you, yeah, no, no. If, if we do this and don't have a polling places, how many people are going to come to you and say, I didn't get a chance to vote? Or could we have one polling place? But could we just then condense it so much? Because we've now mailed it out, we only need one polling place. I don't know. Well, what yeah. kind of safety nets in place? Yeah. You're nodding, Pam. Um, are you just sort of acknowledging that these are things that we need to think about? Or, or, or are, you, are you saying that that yes, maybe we do need to have a, a polling place. I, I wouldn't be against having a polling place. Mm -hmm. I guess that's why I'm not a, um, you know, again, this is something that we're, that we're sort of talking about because we want to increase voter participation in a municipal election. And what we have right now certainly doesn't address the issue. Mm -hmm. So. I, and, I, and I do recognize that a lot of people do like to go to the polls on election day. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's something that they feel very strongly about, but, um, you know, trying to find that happy medium to... Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's a process mm -hmm. where, you know, you're reducing the polling places until people get used to the mail-in mm -hmm. voting. And No, I think I think it's you know I think the average I said that of the people that show up on election day was 30, 30 something percent. I mean that means that you know sixty something percent of the registered voters in Northampton haven't been heard mm -hmm. on election day, and not that not that it, you know, I don't want to predict what people you know how the turnout would be, but. Yeah. What is the cost, uh, the, the, the mailing cost of uh, the city census? <laughs> just, just did that number. It was, uh, it was about $13,000, mm -hmm. the city census. Mm -hmm. We mailed to 14,000 households, so <coughs> we, um, Would be more obviously registered voters. There's like 19,500 and something registered voters, um, and that cost was thirteen thousand dollars for the census. Yeah, mm -hmm. for the census. Uh, uh, so we're looking at. A cost of somewhere between fifteen and twenty thousand for uh, ballot mailing. I calculated at thirty-nine thousand. You calculated thirty-nine thousand. I mean, if you're going, well, Oregon was one sixty-five a ballot. I was going a little higher because you said cost to scale. So I said two dollars a ballot, and we have nineteen thousand registered voters. I, I think it's like a dollar sixty-five for us to mail the ballot today. That's what it costs us to mail the ballot. But is that including the ballot itself? Yeah. And so the printing of the cost to print the ballot and to mail it is a dollar sixty-five. No, no, I'm point. sorry. The the cost to um, process. No, to m just mail it out without the printing part of it. So just if you figure page. it's five, it's five thousand dollars to print the ballots. That's what it costs us. So if you add a dollar, you know. Five thousand divided by 
19,000 voters add that cost to it. Um, well, I mean, postage alone is $31,000, $31,300. If it's just purely $1.65 times 19,000. And so my, my, um, my statement to that would be it would be pretty much a wash to what it costs us to run an election mm -hmm. with seven voting air, you know, um, Precincts. Places Precincts. with 14 precincts, right. so <clears throat> 32,000 and change. Would you still have to have, like, would you be able, because you'd still need people to feed the ballots and all that stuff, but you'd be able to reduce the amount of workers? Straight on here, it has workers cost twenty two thousand. That's for all the fourteen for all the locations. Yeah, and you wouldn't need nearly. I can't imagine that we would know. I mean, you know, we, you know. Would more it, the overtime expense listed? Is that your office mm -hmm. getting paid? Do you, do you anticipate more overtime because more of the work is falling on you guys? I, again, I haven't. I, I'm not predicting what the outcome of this yeah. would be, so it's hard to say what, you know, what the end result would be. Where we go? I mean, they, it could be that they don't even come to the city clerk's office. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that. My, if 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 you went, up, you know, went with that train of thought and had them come to the city clerk's office, then. Um, I would say that we would do as much as we can to have it work um, between our work, you know, standard work hours. Well, yes, but we're talking about a substantial amount of time processing ballots. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I appreciate your, you know, your, your, your sense that perhaps it could be accommodated within normal work hours, but I'm not sure that agrees. I haven't done it, Sam. No, no, I understand that. I understand. I, I just, I, I think what we're getting at here is that the, that, that there, you know, that it might not be exactly a wash, that there may be, there will still be ballot processing costs. And we would, we would probably have to consider the, the, the fact that, that at least you know, at, at the start, it may be an additional cost than what we've been spending on elections to this point. And, and that's not to make a judgment about the concept. It's, it's just a, it's a, it's a statement that that's one of the yeah. consequences we need to consider. But I want to be clear, I'm not nitpicking my, the expenses. No, and, like, and, and my statement to that would be that we're only reaching 30% yeah. of the voters. Mm -hmm with that $30,000 that yes. we're spending. So is it Almost. worth it to us to spend another, you know, X amount to reach 85%? Totally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay, other, other questions about this concept? So in terms of moving forward with these two ideas, we need to pick one of them. Right. Right. Can't have both. <laughs> no. it's, it's like a level line. It's, it's well, well, right. Ma mailing uh, ballots to all voters would it, would eliminate the need for an excuse. Yes, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, they're they're uh, they're sort of different tiers of of trying to engage the voters. So yes, uh, but in terms of recommending changes to the charter. Would we be able to write in, hey, let's start with this, and then we move to that? Well, I, I would think that ultimately we would only recommend one of these. Yeah, ones. which is why I'm saying we need to pick one. Well, right, <clears throat> I mean, we don't need to do that tonight. No, 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 no. but like that's what we need to come to decision. Yes. Mm -hmm. If we want to do either of these, it needs to be one. Mm -hmm. And what would your preference be, just curious? I would prefer that they get mailed to the voter. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, you know, we, I mean, Captain, I don't know if you have anything to add, but we did talk about this at the Board of Registrars 
meeting and our feeling was is that that's our mission you know to increase voter participation and to do whatever we can essentially to make that happen so yeah I mean I think that's true I, I, you touched a little bit on but I think it's important to to acknowledge the 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 shift in or the impact on community culture. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of people, and I count myself among them, who really love to go to precinct and vote. Mm -hmm. and, um, to t and in part because it's a community act, right? You're there and you're there with other people and, and you're, you, you have an intention to go and to vote. Um, it, 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 when I have voted absentee, you know, it's not quite the same to put it in the mailbox and to do it in, the, in my home um, in this kind of unofficial, informal way. Um, so there, there, there is a loss, I think, in terms of that community <coughs> culture. Um, at the same time, um, it's, it is very much at the heart of what um, our job is, um, our mission as the Board of Registrars is to um, really engage the public in a meaningful way and to maximize every resident's participation in our uh, common life. And um, it does appear um, in the, in the um, jurisdictions that have taken this mail mailing um, out the ballots and having them mailed back or delivered back, however, um, that it has impacted, has increased voter turnout in a meaningful way. And I think that that's, that's at the heart of what we do. And mm -hmm. we can, if we can change that in our municipal elections, I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to comment on the community culture as well. I think, you know, being someone who's very active in local and state and national politics, and I stand at the polls and I work on elections, the, you know, the sea change is going to be with a larger number of people voting, the, the, the sort of organizational politics is going to change and shift with that. So I'm already thinking about, well, what am I going to do now? I'm going to have to go down to City Hall for a shift. And, and I think that we, you know, our culture is going to change along with the larger number of people voting and that, that we will find our ways to right. impact, um, you know, voting day and getting people out to vote and being someplace. I, I think, you know, first I was thinking, oh, shoot, I can't, I'm not going to be standing up here, hanging around here in the large all day, you know, and over to Wood 6, but, you know, actually, I think pe what will happen, it's so important to people and to organizations and to, you know, to, to people to, to um, get their, their um, you know, the representative elected that we'll figure it out and we'll figure out ways in which we impact people's opinions. Um, Right now, you know, in a younger community of voters, they're not out there standing at the polls, they're texting. All of the information that I get from um, people who are younger than, you know, uh, 30, 35, they're, they're texting me about what I'm doing and what I, how I'm going to vote. And they're not at the polls. That's how, that's how they communicate. And it's, it's a huge change in the, in the um, politics world because that's, that's what's that's what's moving elections. That's how Obama got elected. That's how people who have been very, sort of been very, very successful in recent years have changed the way that they convince voters to vote. And um, I think another generation will participate in a different way. Yeah. And it is a loss, but it's not going to prevent that person from voting. They're not going to say, I can't go to the polls, so I'm not going to vote. I don't see that happening. You know. I'm, well, you said the data says that people, more people vote. I mean, more people yes, will vote, but I don't think you're going to lose the people that are going to polls for the experience. I mean, this is just so consistent no. with everything else in our society. It's we changing. register our cars online. We, oh, everything yeah. is done online. You know? I mean, we're, mm -hmm. other than the post office, I was actually standing in line in the post <laughs> yeah. office saying, this is 
the last place in the world to stand in line. You don't even have to, because you can get downline stamps on. You can do Well, I had some other things I didn't do, but. Um, so, so, certainly a laudable goal to increase participation. And anything we can do to facilitate the achievement of that goal is a good thing. Um, has there been has there been any discussion among your your peers about fraud issues, for example? Mail gets sent to everybody. How do you know that the person doing the voting is in fact the person you sent it to? I mean that's a that's a big issue. Um, and is it a big issue? Because you just don't why we don't have any of the phone place. Well, all right, so it's potentially a big issue, but let's just say with all the with all the venom that voter fraud has engendered over minuscule evidentiary data, right? Here, here you are, you know, saying you're going to mail it out to everybody. Has there been any consideration for validation of, of who's filling it out? I think we would use sorry the same exact same protocols that we do now with absentee ballots. I mean, essentially, it's the same process that we use for every absentee ballot that we send out. So there's a signature required. We don't just hand them out over the the counter. You send it to the designated address of that um, registered voter. And and our experience with the absentee process has been. Um, Uniformly um, fraud free. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, you're, you're, how many absentees do you do in a year? You mentioned that earlier. Mm -hmm. well, we, well, we did 2,500. Mm -hmm. So you can do 10 times as, as many as that. Yeah. And you're not, and you're just sending it out to everybody. You're not sending it out to people who are self selected by asking for it. Right. Um, in Oregon, you, know, you keep using that state, but they. Um, they have a system whereby they check every single ballot. Yeah. Um, and the checking continues even after election day. So if they, you know, they cast the ballot, but then if there's a question about a signature on, um, I shouldn't say the checking, but the verification mm -hmm. continues even after election day. People get sent letters that say your signature didn't match. And yeah. I, I was lucky enough to see Stacey Abrams speak, speak a few weeks back about voter suppression and voter fraud and and basically, you know, she said people aren't we can't get people to vote. Mm -hmm. Our worry shouldn't be about having people vote that don't want to. It really I mean it, it, it's it's not the issue. The issue is to get more people to vote. Except that in North Carolina, we had right. an issue this last year. Yes, um, and I was about to say, I mean, uh, there are some and, instances down south. And, and if you're just mailing, as as Bob said, to self-selected voters, as opposed to bulk mailing to everyone, the, the possibility for those who have malicious intentions to start scooping up ballots out of or, mailboxes. Or, or husband and wives. And I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting this is going to be a huge <laughs> issue, but I'm trying to protect you, man. Yeah. Because all it's going to take is one disgruntled wife that said, my son of a bitch husband grabbed my thing and voted, and I know he didn't vote the way I wanted to vote. Uh, you know. I think this happens too few and far between. I'm too concerned about access. I'm too concerned about institutional discrimination. I don't think these things happen often enough. Um, but it is people's concern around slippery slopes and things like that that get in the way of things like access. So I'm just putting that out there. I agree with that. I agree with you. So just can I just Clarify. Yes. This is only for this process would only be municipal elections. So then we could, in theory, have an entirely separate process for our state elections. We which would. We would. So that in and of Wait, itself could be really confusing. And would that then end up hindering our turnout on either on either of the elections or any of the elections? Because sometimes when we add more, it's not helping, it's just confusing. And I think this is 
great. I just, I think I would like to see it broader, not just us. Are you aware of any communities outside of the three states that have, um, have adopted this practice? Single communities? Yes. No. no. Okay, so it's right now, as far as we know, it's done on a statewide basis, only in Oregon, Washington, and Colorado. So, I, I, the question, Lynn, that you're raising is um, different year, different system. Yeah, different. different yeah, yeah, every two years will be yeah. different. Yeah. And then if yeah. we go to all mail in, we only have one voting location where you could go in person. That doesn't, that's not the same your next election you vote in. Mm -hmm. So, so you're, you're raising the, the question of then is that going to confuse voters to the point where they may choose not to participate? Right, or it, and, and it be, makes they it have the opposite effect of what we're right. trying to do. Right, that make. and it makes, I could see it making it harder for people actually working at an election because they're going to now be dealing with confused voters. I don't know. I, I, I think that there's so much uh, ability to get information that people, you know, even when we have multiple questions on a state ballot, people, people get things in the mail, they, um, they have canvassing door to door, you, you kind of get um, many messages in many ways about voting, how to vote, and I, it seems to me that every two years when people hear about an election and they have an interest, that that there's well, there's plenty of information about it. I mean, we you know we have yeah. newspaper and we have, and and that message will just be constant to people. And I think once again, it's just something that it needs to happen for a while for people to get used to the fact that municipal elections are by mail and state elections you go to the polls. And, um, and if you want to vote, you're going to figure out a way to vote. And if we're yeah. pulling in more voters along the way, then that's only positive. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I think there are going to be people that say, just like when I'm working in, the, you know, in one of the election offices, there are always people who come in who come in and say, so who's on the ballot this year? And it could be, you know, a huge election. And so when where do I go? I mean, there are all there's always a segment of uninformed, um, unable to figure it out, and unless they make do an action to find out. But I I think that in the interest of getting people to vote, the, the best thing we can do is be proactive and make a change um, to a mail ballot. So, and, and I, I've been willing to guess that in the future we're going to see mail ballot in the state. I mean, I think that's sort of the movement in states where there are, um, you know, there's, there's um, you know, movement to expand the ability to vote. I mean, we're not going to see it in North Carolina, and they're really taking it away, but. I think we could be a trailblazer, too, and I'm a better, you know, I think. We being North Carolina, mm -hmm. yes. Other other thoughts from anybody on the committee? Okay, uh, we we've heard the city clerk say that um, as we consider these two um, uh, potential changes, and they would be um, uh, they would be ap applicable only to municipal elections in North Hampton, that she would prefer that we. If we recommend uh, one, but not the other, that we recommend uh, mailing ballots to voters, to all, to all voters. Um, and I don't know that there's any way to get more evidence about how this works elsewhere, because we've heard, at least in the, in the instance of Oregon, um, how it's working on a statewide level. Uh, apparently, there are no communities outside of those states that have, that have done this. We, we, we can't be certain about, we, we, we think that the cost would be roughly equal, but we can't be, be certain it would be a, a direct wash. So to me, this is more kind of a, a, a conceptual um, decision that we would make rather than, and you know, the language seems to me to be pretty simple. Um, so I, I, I think, uh, we're at a point where we don't need more research on this. I think we'll, we'll wait to hear what we get on the absentee, the no excuse absentee front. 
from Sam, and then we language can... Language-wise? Yes, language-wise. And then we can sort of weigh the two again. Um, unless anybody has any, any, any other thoughts about other evidence or, or research that you feel should be done about uh, male balance. No? Okay. All right, ranked choice voting. We heard a lot um, at the forum. We also got, I don't know if you um, uh, have looked closely at the revised uh, presentation that uh, Howard, was it Howard? Howie. 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 That, that Howie said. Uh, there was some mix up in slides and, and so I mean, it didn't change the. the like D and E? Yeah, it didn't change the underlying message, but just if you get a chance, that's in yesterday's email from, from Ian uh, G. Ford, which is uh, his revised uh, presentation. But to the, to, the, to the main question about ranked choice voting, other. Um, Questions that, uh, that you have, other research that you feel we should do, other, other... I think you can't get better research than those visuals, and I think you can't present it other than having those visuals. I think it was excellent. I don't see any reason why we wouldn't do this. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Molly. All right, other, other thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I agree with Molly. In fact, the only other question I have about it, and I, I'm, it just, it's just, I'm, I'm not sure how the city would um, explain it to the voters. I mean, that public education, which we will be assured that happens, and I'm sure it will, um, I just don't know who would be responsible for it and how would we do it. And I don't really think that we have to decide that. I think that's mm -hmm. going to be... Yeah. <laughs> Did they say the yes. Negro women voters? Mm -hmm. And they, they yes. themselves say they offer public education. Mm -hmm. But I agree, it's almost, you, you almost can't do it without the presentation. Yes. You do need the presentation. And the question of, is it available in, in different languages? Which I think he said it was. In Spanish? Um, our ballots aren't now. The, say that again? We, our ballots are not in Spanish now. The ballots aren't in Spanish. I'm talking about the sort of the, his presentation of the ranked choice, but our ballots aren't in Spanish. There's an anticipation that there's going to be state money that's going to support a statewide campaign of education. Again, that's tied up with the fate of the legislation um, in both houses. Um, I, I think we can be quite certain that people will understand the concepts by the time they get to use it, which is still quite a ways away. Mm. And I don't think we should burden ourselves particularly about that. Um, you know, uh, I'm, my, my concerns are, my concern at the moment is that the, the city embrace this, if we choose to do it, in such a way that assures that the clerk is going to have the resources she's going to need to implement this. And that's my concern. Um, there's a couple of aspects of technology that need to be sorted out. Um, and then um, there are staffing issues. Uh, and I, you know, I would hope that any motion that we put forward on this it includes a provision that the clerk be given the resources she needs to effectively implement and administer. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, the numbers that were thrown around on these other issues tend to make me a little queasy because you could end up getting to be quite a, quite a financial package that we're looking forward to just on election issues. Mm -hmm. So I'm sort of curious, Pam, do you anticipate any issues with doing all three, like if we did mail-in ballot, rank choice voting, and lower the, you know, the voting age? Is that doable for your office to do at once? Um, you know, to be perfectly honest, I think you should pick a goal, mm -hmm. not, I mean, maybe two out of the three, but not all three. I think there you might have some confusion for the voter, yeah. um, especially around, you know, they're getting their ballot in the mail and all of a sudden it's a ranked choice mm -hmm. ballot. Um, that may be problematic. 
So they might just change that one. No, I mean, I, I, I mean that's just my initial thought without much thinking <laughs> to be perfect. But, but um, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I, I think to me personally, the, the idea of right choice voting seems pretty clear. But I, but well, you, you're talking, Pam, about. Uh, Burden on voters, the confusion that, that might come with multiple changes. Not, 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 not a burden on your office, right? Right. Okay. The the cost. There were there's a software upgrade cost. It does. It, from what we've heard at East Hampton and here, there will be a one-time eight thousand dollars software upgrade. Will be. Machine? No. To, to, to run the tabulations. Eight thousand total. Correct. Um, but who who knows? I mean, this should that, that's a number that was cited in East Hampton, and, uh, and as far as I know, is still a, is fairly accurate for here. But I think you know. Between now and the time we finish, we ought to sit with the clerk and try to identify with more clarity, you know, what aspects of this are going to be uh, real, you know. Um, I, I, if I may also just refocus this a little, to the extent that uh, ranked choice voting doesn't fly, we still have a flawed preliminary election <laughs> process that we can't be left with. I mean, that that just can't happen. Um, so I don't know if you agree with that. We need to address the the issue of preliminary elections, whether it's the ranked choice voting or some other way. Yes. I just don't want that to get lost. Yes. I will ask. I will put a big asterisk <laughs> next to that, though. Um, I have a question on the technology piece, because as we were sitting there hearing the presentation. And it may not be an issue if ranked choice voting lets, if say for example we need a special election um, because someone you know, can't fulfill their term, how we would have to write in, I'm assuming, how far back we could go to make that second choice? Do you well, see that, that's so if you decided to, to forego a special election and take the second person. Right. Who was on the ballot. So we would have to set a time frame for right. that. So, so if it's a four year term and it's the first year as opposed to the fourth year. Yep. But if we didn't do that and we needed a special election, I was, and there may be examples where this would or wouldn't work. I was wondering, because we've had situations where we've run a city election at a state election. We had a separate ballot. How could our technology handle that? Well, I haven't done a lot of work on the on the hardware piece of it or the software piece of it, but my understanding is that the that the soft the um, machines would still you'd still use them the same. It's it's that data would just get brought back to the city clerk's office, and then it's a run through a separate. Um, processor to determine the outcome based on rank choice. So the counts are still done the same um, at the polling location. So the question is, I think, now that I'm, I'm not the light bulb, just want to, can the, our equipment at the same time process a regular ballot and a ranked choice ballot right. at the same time. Yeah, I don't know if you Just me explaining it. Good question. question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, uh, <laughs> 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 and it may not be an issue. <laughs> of a special municipal election on a state election day, then we have a, we have a separate municipal ballot on 
in that instance, correct? And still get run through the same tabulator. Yes, I know, but but but, but I mean the the equipment is going to need to process state and national ballots in the usual manner anyway. Why wouldn't it be able to process a ranked choice ballot as well? Because I don't know how ranked choice ballots are processed to begin with, so I, I, I don't understand the, that end of it yet. Mm -hmm. But but logically, our, I mean, we're not going to have two separate pieces of, I mean, isn't it, it's in the software that, that the ranked choice <coughs> is processed, not in, the, not in the voting machines, right, not in the hardware. So you would use one, you would have to use one piece of software for the state ballot and, the, and the, another piece of software for the ranked choice ballot, I think. Well, well, we would hope that it would be the same software just programmed to read well, two separate ballots. Well, yes, that, but, okay. But you would maybe flip the switch. In the, do you know how it works, Bob? Well, well, I'm, I'm, I don't think, my understanding is that it's, we would be paying for an upgrade to the software that we currently have that accommodates ranked choice voting. Same hardware and enhanced software platform. Is what I understand. Does the question before the committee were whether we agree in concept to the prospect of ranked choice voting rather than, you know, provided we have the mechanism for it, provided there are the resources for it, what is the decision before the, the committee? Uh, at, this point? at this point, we're not to that point yet. We're, we're, we're simply asking for what additional information research needs to be done to bring us to the point where we can feel comfortable in voting whether or not to recommend to go forward with ranked choice voting. I would, I would suggest that, you know, perhaps, I, I think you need to get into the weeds of these questions to determine whether you think this is, you know, something to recommend. But if you recommend, there's going to be a whole lot more work that's going to have to be done by our legislative body because they have a role in this, and by the executive yes. because yes. you know. And so uh, we're not going to be able to in, in this committee to you know, make all of the changes to the charter that might need to be made in order to implement this. This is just a recommendation to implement, and which the, the council and the mayor can take or leave. Mm -hmm. I can just suggest that, I mean, again, uh, I visited East Hampton and I talked to a couple other players, but or parties that want to do this, the language that ends up going to the legislative body from this group is likely very simple, like a couple of sentences. You know, we had trouble uh, filling <laughs> vacancies on the uh, no. on, I mean, of trustees. No, this this is going to be this is going to be complicated. It's not simple. I mean, good. We're completely revamping our election system, and it's not simple. So, I just put that out there that you know, let's not get too lost in the details. You know, consider the details to the extent it, it informs your your recommendation, but. And again, the, the, what we would be doing is recommending to the mayor to implement this, but no, you, city, city council. To the figure at city council. But we would, uh, our role, if we were to recommend, would be to make this language accessible so that if we wanted to implement, it would be, what, built into the charter? It's got, and then it's got to go to a vote. I just want to make sure I'm understanding what our role is at different stages. Okay. So your role is to make recommendations for changes to the charter to the city, city council, council and to the mayor. File it with the city clerk, who then transmits it to the city council and to the mayor, and then it's in the legislative process. But we wouldn't have to do anything with language at this point. And Probably not. That's what, I'm, that's what I was trying to say. Probably we're not going to. I, you know, that's why when we started this, I tried to s separate uh, between sort of the language tweaks that we we right. were looking for and the big concepts, which were really not equipped it, I don't think, mm -hmm. to completely revamp the entire charter. But that's a process, and, and so, you know, what would probably happen would be that the city council would form a committee 
who would take your recommendations and start working on them, and we'd work on language and bring it to the city council. <coughs> but you're the beginning of the process, not the end of the process. But I'm sorry, Alan, just a piece of clarification. Yeah. You're saying we there would actually wouldn't be any changes to the language, but you're also saying we would have to revamp the charter. The well, charter would, not you, uh -huh. but the charter would have to be revamped in, in a number of ways. I mean, this is, this is a complete reorganization of how we do elections, or would be. So uh, I'm not sure that, that this committee is actually going to completely revamp our charter. Mm -hmm. You're going to make a recommendation to the city council, if that's the way you vote, to move to ranked choice voting and eliminate preliminary elections. Uh, so our recommendation doesn't need to come in the form of legalese. It doesn't. I mean, obviously, if you have the language, fine. But I, I'm I'm just yeah, cautioning against trying to redraft this entire charter yeah. in this committee. You're just making recommendations to the city council and to the mayor um, on what you think uh, appropriate changes to the charter would be, and then it's going to be up to the city council and the mayor to work through the charter and figure out the specific language. So they're the ones who do the quote unquote revamping. Yes. Just like you don't do anything, bill, right? you know, you, 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 you <laughs> yeah, don't actually do out. anything, mm -hmm. you're, yeah, out. Yeah. you're recommending, and, and again, you know, the, the... Well, so legal language is one thing, I mean, how, you know, in your, in your view, how certain do we have to be of all the technical nuances and all the other, you know, implications? Right, that's why I suggest, you know, you get into the weeds just to inform yourself on whether this is something that, that's doable and appropriate. Exactly. But, but um, I'm not, I don't think that anybody's expecting you to completely redraft right. this charter. We had this charter drafted by professionals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and similarly, you know, electioneering and election technology is done by experts as right. well. So, so what would you consider, so, sorry, did you want to go ahead? Well, I, I was just going to say that I, I see it like as if we were a group of people who are, are deciding to file a bill and you go to the legislators and you say this is what you want to see and then it goes through these steps that it has to go through and the end result is never what the, the, the initial bill was, the initial decision or it, it's, it's what all these steps of change what, what the end result is going to be. Unless I'm missing something, you know, if, it, if it's simply a matter of making a recommendation, I don't know what you consider, Alan, suffice in terms of information and research that informs us just making a recommendation. I'm operating under the assumption that we have heard a presentation, and from that presentation, if we are simply to make a recommendation, I am comfortable making that recommendation because ranked choice voting feels like the wave of the future, and I'd love Northampton to be on the right side of history on that piece. So. From there, if it's up to everyone else to sort of make a decision around, you know, mechanism and how would it be implemented, can we really do this, are we staffed up enough and resourced enough, that's on them. That's right. right now, I simply saw a presentation that I agree with, I would like to make that recommendation. I feel like it's fairly simple. What am I missing? Well, and I think so, it, it's just... Well, well, I mean, you saw a recommendation. In, or a presentation. A, a pres um, yeah. You saw a presentation. It was an excellent presentation. It was very convincing, has a lot of strong points. Now, when you actually take that and put it into, implement it. So you're making a recommendation that the city council and the mayor can implement or not. That's what I, I mean. But the, it's only responsible to do a little homework. That's well, that's right, because you don't know whether it's, what wh whether right to recommend it homework. until you've heard the details of it and, and can, on some level, uh, make a calculation as to whether this is something that's actually doable, doable. in the city. Mm -hmm. okay. And why would you recommend something that is fiscally okay. or otherwise just... To make someone else say we can't do that right. when we knew that it wasn't feasible. Mm -hmm. We're right. also like presenting this to the city council right. and they're going to have questions. So if we just say, I like it, mm -hmm. you know, I, so sure. I think like, sure. we're going to have We our can answers. do research, but I think we don't need to go too far into it. We thought this and think that we're the end all be all with how these are going to and so, you know, what I would expect is that some part of this group would appear at a city council meeting and make a presentation of exactly what you're recommending to the city council. You'll, you know, you'll have your PowerPoint or whatever, and you'll go through the, uh, the points of, of 
recommendation to the council. And it differs too, like the things for the trustees of Forbes, that doesn't necessarily have to, that doesn't require a home rule petition necessarily. You know what I mean? Like, so these, that's good to have exact language right. for that. I mean, they might still change it, but bigger issues. And, and this might happen in stages. So yeah. we have a special act that does all of the line, you know, mm -hmm. the kind of technical language changes and we'll just file that, get that done while the city council committee, uh, you know, some ad hoc committee is going forward with ranked choice voting or, or no excuse or mail ballots to voters, 16 year old voting, and they're gonna debate this amongst themselves. And if they decide this is something that they're gonna wanna do, either I, along with professionals, or I alone will take a shot at it, but, you know, mm. coming up with language is really, for something this extensive is probably beyond the, the scope of this committee, I would think. I feel much better here. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, and I do think it's important to consider the implications of multi, since these choices all intersect, right. of if we have mail out ballots at the same time as ranked choice voting. And I mean, we don't want to deliver a really chaotic message to city council. No, but you could be del delivering the message to the council that. This committee believes that mailing ballots to all of the citizens is the way to go and you ought to proceed to amend the charter. We believe that ranked choice voting is something that is the way to the future, is something that we should do and we should get behind and they're gonna do their due diligence on that issue. But I, I just don't think that it's possible for you to rewrite the charter in this committee. I mean, we had you know the Collins Center come and write this charter. I mean, this didn't just, you know, mm -hmm. appear. It's, it's a technical bit of business. So there's a balance. I mean, that's all, that was very helpful, I think. <laughs> yeah. I just thought we were getting too far out into the into the details of the charter. This is, no, I, make recommendations. Right, no, I appreciate that. You know, I, and I just want to make sure that everyone on the committee feels comfortable that they have enough information before <clears throat> them to, to um, to uh, vote to recommend on any of these or or these all in, in, in their entirety and I think that Dylan has raised a good point that we we can't look at these just individually that we should consider what the impact of this entire package might be so you could recommend doing this one at a time I think we should move first to um, rank choice voting and then in and then we should be moving to mail ballots or vice versa. Or, uh, I mean, those are the kinds of recommendations you could be making yes. as you recognize that it's too much to do all at once. Yes. Yes. And we have another 10 years to get all this done, so it's not a problem. <laughs> okay, any, any other thoughts on any of these issues? I do want to raise something to put on the agenda for next. Well, yes, but, but Sam had one additional point that she wanted to yes, us for, I will for be us to, con to consider. At, uh, at a, uh, we'll do. We'll talk about it at a later. Yes, but, and this came up with the idea. Um, I I don't think we should have term limits. I know that got brought up at the forum and other times, um, but with the idea that people were saying it can be hard to run against an incumbent. So one idea of removing that barrier would be to remove on the ballot candidate for re-election. As I was kind of thinking, it's like free advertisement, which I talked to Pia about it and she pointed out it could actually work against the candidate too, which I get. But if we're trying to the title, the label it, itself. So like, you know, it says it next to an incumbent. It says candidate for re-election unless they were appointed to fill a vacancy. So removing that language from the ballot um, which this would obviously, this would have to go to the state because it's dictated by state law. Um, but just with the spirit of how can we make it, how can we bring down barriers of people who are not wanting to run against incumbents? And there's a there's a bill. This is not my thought. This was Rep. Dom's thought. I was talking about it with her yesterday. But she has a bill right now that it doesn't have a hearing yet, but um, she has language for it. Hmm. Just something well, I, to ponder. I like the idea of removing barriers like the ones you mentioned. I would say, I don't think that's the only barrier. No, not at all. Um, 
and I'm, I guess I'm hesitant to sort of, are we, you know, if we're not in a discussion of term limits, if we've already sort of containerized that and moved on, um, then, you know, I will go with the group. I, you know, if it's interesting for this group to consider, I did have a conversation with someone over the course of the weekend at the Massachusetts Senate President's event for Emerge, and there was, um, a staffer from Emily's List there who does a lot of this work of recruiting in particular underrepresented groups and I asked him what he thought of term limits in terms of an issue of access, in terms of an issue of inclusion and he had strong feelings that term limits were a barrier um, though he put a cap at eight years, believe it or not, because he felt that it takes that much time. I think someone else similarly made that case to learn the ropes of the position to understand the position, so you need that time. In fact, having something lower is actually um, is discriminatory in a sense. So, if it's interesting for that perspective to be folded into the mix, I wanted to share that with you. Well, I mean, we can, you know, we can reopen the discussion on term limits. Maybe not tonight. Not tonight. No, but I meant, I mean. That's, I mean, I, I don't think anything that we've sort of you know, put on a back burner can't come to the forefront mm -hmm. again. So mm -hmm. if, if there's a feeling that it's something that we need to look at during this Sorry, review, then, during this review <laughs> then, then we, we can do that. Right? Yeah. Nothing has been put off the table permanently. Right. Okay. But I think I think that this proposal is is uh, certainly different from the, the concept of, of term limits. Yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, it's not addressing everything about term limits. Just right. something that people had said, like a piece is one of the. Reasons, so. All right. So we'll we'll um, we'll have further discussion of that at a, at a future meeting. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention tonight um, is that we we've, we've talked. Uh, about inclusion and encouraging inclusion in, in participating in, in elections and running for office um, as one of our as one of our goals and um, I've been thinking about what we can do as a committee um, as we as we hope to hear from you know many constituents in, in Northampton uh, in terms of uh, being more proactive in reaching out to minority communities, um, and one you know one idea is to perhaps uh, uh, organize a forum specifically where we would have translators available specifically to hear from minority communities. Can we call them underrepresented groups instead of minorities? Okay, underrepresented groups. Um, so I, I, I'm 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 you know I'm, I'm uh, eager to hear from others on the committee whether you know what what ideas you have for how we can uh, be more proactive in reaching out to underrepresented communities. Whoa! I, I wonder if we should table discussion. that conversation. I think that's a bigger yeah. discussion, and I, I but I think it's a good one to address. Yes. Well, I, I just am planting the seed tonight, mm -hmm. and I, you're uh, doing a great job of that. <laughs> I, I want yes, people to yeah, think about yeah. that, and we'll re, we'll continue. Um, we'll revisit it at our next at our next yeah. meeting. Okay. That sounds good. Okay. Could I, I get you had, you had, uh, Yes, I will be brief. I just think that we should, I wanted to go back to this when I came in late. I heard Bill Newman's the end of his presentation, and then that you had asked for your response, and you gave us some information that I didn't fully understand because I don't. I had to really think about what Bill's proposal was. And we suggested that he bring forward the language that he suggested um, around the balance of power and what it really means to be um, a, a city council that's truly representative of you know larger electorate. And mm. I I I don't want to dismiss what you brought up, and I think it is a discussion to be had about whether we want to have. Um, a government that's a strong mayor um, or a strong city council, and whether that language he suggested actually does that—that that was my other thought. Mm -hmm. I just think that I would like to address it again, mm -hmm. 
And I wouldn't mind Melvin coming back to because I, I couldn't think of examples of what he you know what he was really getting at. And I sense that you both had a different opinion. Well, we've been around and around and around. You have, but oh, yeah. so this isn't our first. Yeah, but it's my first. So yeah, so I I don't know if anybody else feels that way, but I I had to really chew on that for a little bit, and he laughed, and we weren't going to talk about it. But I would like to address it again. Well, he's going to send mm -hmm. some language to. Uh, the mayor's mm -hmm. office, so we'll have something next meeting to, to look at. Mm -hmm. do, I do, does anyone else share that we'd like to uh, look at this? I think again? it would be useful to have our city council representative there. Yes. Mm -hmm. conversation happens okay. Day. I'm confused by yeah. what he said. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I think he, it was yeah. a concept, but it wasn't, um, what's the word? Uh, you know, like concrete. Concrete, yeah, that's exactly what well, he's going to have some specific language that mm -hmm. he will send us, and we'll have that to look at this meeting. Okay. The other, um, the other thing I'd like to do at our May 21st meeting is to um, consider our summer schedule. Mm -hmm. Some of you may have um, vacations planned during the summer, mm -hmm. and um, I, I'd like That's to take those. That's a lovely those. assumption. Mm -hmm. That's a lovely assumption. Um, well, or you know, I mean, I just like to. to I'm pleased with the pace of our work, um, uh, but we have still a lot before us. But I'd like, you know, I'd like to consider um, uh, what would work for the committee before June, July, and August at, at our May 21st meeting. So that's one other thing that uh, we'll talk about. Okay. Good. Good. Anything else? All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? We'll do that in a second. Okay. All in favor? I like it. Okay.